Welcome to Bluegrass. We are so glad that you joined us today. We hope you find this time together to be uplifting and inspirational. Above all, we want you to feel welcome. So if you have any questions, prayer requests, or just want to know more about how to get connected to Bluegrass, visit bluegrassumc.org connect. Today, Doug begins a new sermon series called Out at Sea. Paul's long, difficult voyage at sea appeared to be out of control and out of hope. At the end of today's worship service, we will share Holy Communion. Take some time to gather some bread and juice or similar elements for yourself and those worshiping with you. Again, thanks for being with us today. Now, let's begin. Let's sing about marvelous grace, the grace of our Lord. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpour, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, sin and despair. Like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God. God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched star, His love endures forever. For life has been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. 
His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in worship. We thank you for each worshiper who is worshiping you today. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your presence, your holy, loving presence. You welcome us in. You want us to come and be with you. And so you've called us to worship today. And it's our joy and our privilege to be here with you. Lord, I thank you for every worshiper. I thank you for their families. Lord, I lift them up to you and ask that whatever needs they might have, whatever concerns they might have, that they would offer them to you right now, and that they would be able to come before you and, and just be able to trust in you and to put their complete faith in you, knowing that you are in control, knowing that you are larger than anything that they are facing today, and they can have absolute assurance of that. Lord, we pray for our world. We need you so desperately. We know that there is a worldwide virus that we need you to stop and we call upon you. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would intervene. Lord, we know that there is much unrest and disunity in our nation and there are many social problems. Lord, we need you to come and intervene in those as well and to bring order and to bring restoration, to bring peace, to bring justice. Most of all, Lord, we need you to come and renew us. We are in desperate need of revival of spirit. We need the church to become alive again in our nation and in our world. We as the church, as the people of the church, need to come alive. It begins with us. It begins with our relationship with you and, and the way we live that relationship out with one another. So we pray, O oh God, that we would humble ourselves, that we would surrender ourselves, that we would totally submit ourselves to you in recognition of your power and of your authority, and that you would renew us and you would renew the face of the earth. Help us to pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We welcome you to worship this Labor Day weekend. I trust you're having a great weekend so far and will continue to do so. Well, today we're beginning a brand new series where we're going to sail out at sea with the Apostle Paul on a very difficult voyage. At times it appeared he was out of control and out of hope, but God was with him and he made it to his destination. You know, life might seem the same for us these days. Maybe, in fact, we feel like those poor people who were stranded out on the cruise ships early on during COVID, those passengers who couldn't get off the ship for weeks at a time. No port would let them come and dock. But not only that, the crew members, two months after COVID began, 
were still stranded. A hundred thousand crew members were still stranded out at sea. Can you even imagine that? But maybe that's where you feel you are with COVID, uh, with work, or with school, with a relationship, or with your health. If so, this series might just be for you. Today, though, we want to begin with the backstory. Paul's backstory, our backstory. In fact, I'd love to be able to sit down and talk with each of you to hear your story. What has brought you to this place in your life? Who are the people? What are the events that have shaped you into the person that you are? Since I can't do that, let me share a little bit of my backstory. My backstory begins with my parents who were strong Christian role models. They loved the Lord and I have vivid memories of them spending time with God each day in prayer and reading scripture. Each had their own place in the house in which they did so. They faithfully took me to church, to Sunday school, and to youth group each week. When I was 12, I I was confirmed into the membership of the church. But it was three months later, in fact, it was 46 years ago this month, that during a Sunday morning worship service that I raised my hand and declared my faith, my heartfelt faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then it was four years after that, again in a worship service, where I heard the call of the Holy Spirit to enter into full-time ministry. I hadn't been thinking about that. That wasn't necessarily a desire of mine, but that morning it was clear that God was calling me, and I responded. And so during those formative years, I had pastors and youth pastors who poured into my life discipling me in this faith and then it was off to college and so I went to a Christian college Asbury University and then to Asbury Theological Seminary which all proved to be so formative in providing that foundation that solid biblical foundation for my ministry you know when Jody came along she was truly a gift from God to be able to partner with in life and ministry however I never expected that we would work together We've been working together for 17 years now. It's actually a miracle in progress that she hasn't killed me yet. Since then, children and grandchildren have come along, had the opportunity of serving four churches. Many of you and many other experiences have all played a part in God's plan to develop me into the follower of Jesus that I am today. So thank you. Let me encourage you to think about And to tell others about those people, those events that have formed your life. That would be a great conversation piece for you to have today. And if those folks are still alive, maybe give thanks to God for them, but maybe shoot them a text or an email or a card saying thank you. Thank you for playing such a vital role in my life. You know, the Apostle Paul had quite a packed story himself. Though not everyone agrees, some scholars have identified these approximate dates for the major events in his life. Paul was born somewhere around the years of 2 to 4 AD. From around the age of 10 to 13, he was trained by that Jewish teacher Gamaliel in Jerusalem. From 29 to 30, he became the chief persecutor of Christians. It was at age 30 that he saw the light on that Damascus road. From 30 to 33, he was in Arabia, growing in his faith. From 33 to 40, he was in Tarsus, which was his hometown. At 40, he went with Barnabas on his first missionary journey. At 41, he went on the second missionary journey. And at 44, he went on the third missionary journey. And it was at 47, he was back in Jerusalem. He was arrested and then imprisoned in Caesarea for two years. And this is where we'll pick up with his life in just a moment. At 49, he was sent to Rome. From 50 to 52, he was in prison in Rome when he began to write his letters. And from 53 to 56, he was free again and able to work. At 57, he was in prison for the last time in Rome. And around the age of 60, he was executed. So at the age of 30, when he was blinded by the light, God got his attention so that he couldn't do any further damage persecuting the growing Christian movement. And God called on a disciple named Ananias who lived in Damascus and told him to go and pray and lay hands on Paul so that he could receive his sight. 
We pick up with this story in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 to 16. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so God chose Paul to preach to the Gentiles, we're told, to kings, and to his own people. Sound like a pretty good gig until that last line where he was told he was going to suffer much for the name of Jesus. As we see Paul's story unfold in the last chapter of the book of Acts, we find that God's word here held true. This all happened. In fact, Paul is in prison in Caesarea, which is in Israel along the Mediterranean coast. He had been falsely accused of bringing spiritually unclean persons into the temple area in Jerusalem. It caused such an uproar that Paul was beaten, arrested, and then there was another plot to kill him as he was going to be transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And then the high priest Ananias, probably the same Ananias or same high priest that Paul worked for when he was persecuting the church, went to Caesarea to bring false charges against Paul just as he had presided over the court that falsely convicted Jesus. So Paul now was under guard in King Herod's palace. What a surprising place to be in jail. It was there that Governor Felix and his wife listened to Paul as he spoke about his faith in Christ. In fact, Scripture says that Felix sent for Paul often to listen to him, but also so that he might offer Felix a bribe. That was his hope. So this went on for two years because Felix wanted to win favor with the Jews by keeping Paul in prison. You know, I wonder if Paul thought his life was being wasted during these days. I wonder if he thought, why am I here? Or did he see something else? Did he see that he was given many opportunities to share his faith? Well, Felix was replaced as a governor by Festus. Don't you love these names? So Paul had to make his defense before him once again and then made his appeal to go before Caesar in Rome because Festus was threatening to send him back to Jerusalem and Paul didn't want to go to Jerusalem. He, being a Roman citizen, could make that appeal to go before Caesar. But before Paul was sent on his way, Festus had him tell his story to King Agrippa, who was in town to pay his respects to the new governor. King Agrippa was the grandson to Herod the Great who wanted Jesus killed as an infant. There's a lot of names here. I don't expect you to remember them all, and they won't be on the final exam. Well, Paul took the opportunity to share his whole testimony of how he met the Lord on the road to Damascus and how God used him to preach to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And then he got personal with King Agrippa and asked him, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And then we pick up with this story in our text for today in Acts chapter 26, verses 28 to 32. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So Paul had been sitting in jail for two years despite the fact that there were really no charges against him. In fact, the Roman king and governor believed that he could be set free. They didn't know what charges to send with him as he would go before Caesar in Rome. And so for two years, there was really no movement. He was out at sea before he ever left the port. And yet we do see God gave him many opportunities to speak to kings and to governors, just as was prophesied that he would, was done even before he left Israel. He had quite an audience and was given opportunity after opportunity. And so 
that's why we don't find in these chapters, in these verses, where Paul is asking, why is this happening to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? He wasn't playing the victim card. He didn't question the goodness of God. Instead, Paul may have reasoned it through this way. As I read these words, I thought I would share them with you. The world in which we live is a very fallen place. As a result, life can be very unfair at times. Injustice will often seem to win in the short run. The powers of darkness and evil are real and violently oppose Jesus Christ. When something awful happens to those pursuing the will of God, it should come as no surprise. Such opposition should serve as a sign that the one under attack is actually proving to be a threat to the enemy. The call of God is stronger than the adversities of this world. Now, I don't speak these statements easily or flippantly, for I know that some of you are and have experienced some troubling experiences in your life that are causing deep pain. And that's the ongoing challenge of discipleship, isn't it? To live in the knowledge and the assurance of God's presence and power when everything around us is telling us a different story, to, to stay centered in the presence of Jesus. You know, when we see others do this, we marvel at their faith. We are inspired by their faith. Their examples encourage us to put our faith in Jesus Christ, and, and they give us courage to press on through our own hardships. As I read stories about those being persecuted around the world, I'm admired by them, and I wonder... Would I do the same? Would I be faithful as they are in the same circumstances? Recently, I read that in the midst of such opposition, that the church in Iran has exploded in growth over the past 10 years. People are losing faith in their government, losing faith in their own default religion. In 2013, Tehran's Assemblies of God Church building closed. It was believed to be one of the last building church buildings still being used for worship so today there are no church buildings being used for the gathering of christians and so christians are still gathering faithfully and illegally by meeting in homes and in parks and other locations house church leaders are being arrested they're being interrogated they're being imprisoned and yet the church in Iran continues to grow. It's believed that there are over a million believers in Iran today. God is doing a work. Even though the church building is closed, the church is still alive and well. You know, I marvel at such a deep faith. I marvel at their perseverance in the midst of such adversity. And I pray the same would be true for me and for you as well. You know, Jesus didn't promise us a trouble-free life. Instead, he made it clear, in this world you're going to have trouble, but take heart, have hope, because I have overcome the world. He promised that he would be with us, he would never leave us, and that in the end we would win because, well, he already won. In the meantime, the more powerless we find ourselves, the more strength we actually have because of the grace that is all-sufficient to hold and to carry us through it all. So as we think back to Paul's timeline, you know, things were going pretty badly for Paul in the prime of his life. He spent a lot of time in, in jail, a lot of time sitting around, but it was also during this time, especially when he went to Rome, that he began to write his letters and sent many letters to various churches to encourage them, to inspire them, to keep them faithful. And guess what? Those letters now compose a large portion of our New Testament. Not only were they used in that particular day to inspire that particular generation of Christians, but now they are the Word of God to inspire, to encourage, and to teach us today, just as when they were first written. So when things seem to be out of our control, when we really don't understand what's going on, when we're out at sea spiritually and emotionally, like Paul, we really don't know what's going to happen next. That's not a fun place to be. It's a tough place to be. But it's also the exact place 
where we choose to put our absolute trust in the God who loves and leads us according to his eternal purposes that will prevail. So what might seem unnecessary or even wrong today in our eyes may be used as God's larger plan to advance his work in the world. And so we cannot, we must not dismiss God's ability to work through all things to bring his goodness to life in and through us. So listen, whatever we're experiencing today becomes tomorrow's backstory. What we're doing with our faith in Christ today matters greatly in where we'll find ourselves spiritually tomorrow. And may I challenge us to take this a step further and not just think about ourselves. How does God want to use us to influence the spiritual backstory of our children, our grandchildren, our small group, our friends, our neighbors, even the acquaintances that we come in contact with? What are our practices? What are our words? Uh, What are our actions that they are seeing that will inspire them to live for Jesus Christ? I'm so grateful for all of you who are part of my backstory. Thank you for being a part of that story. And I pray that God is using me to influence someone else's backstory for their spiritual benefit so that they will enjoy the presence of God forever and ever. You know, we know that Jesus' backstory is our salvation story. He walked the earth in our shoes. He died because of our sin. He rose to victory over death. He ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit descended upon us. He rules with the Father in heaven over all creation. And he promises one day to return to restore all of this mess into order, into perfection, into goodness. This is what we remember and what we celebrate in Holy Communion. Let's prepare our hearts and minds as we sing together. As a church, let's lift our praises to the greatness of our God. Great are you, Lord. You give light. You are love. You bring light. To the darkness you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour. give life. You give life. You are love. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is all the earth Peace. 
Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for your many wonderful and good gifts to us. We thank you for all the people that you have placed in our lives, family and friends and neighbors, co-workers, friends at school. We thank you for each and every one that has played a part in our life to make us who we are today. We thank you for the experiences. We know some of those experiences have not been good and, and, and from our perspective today are, are not good in what we're living in, but yet we know that you are greater. You are greater than all of these things and can accomplish your purposes in our lives. So we thank you. Most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life, death, and resurrection. We thank you for his promised return. We thank you that his story can become our story that his backstory is our spiritual salvation. And so we put our faith and our trust in him today. Maybe for the first time, we want to declare Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord. We do that even now. And maybe for some of us, we're ready to renew our faith in Jesus Christ. And so we do that now. Lord Jesus, we put our faith and trust in you anew. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us, we pray, O oh God. Wipe away everything that is not like you in our lives. Give us the power by your Spirit to repent, to turn away from them and turn totally to you. Help us to be people who love you and to love one another and to show the way of Jesus to so many other people that we can influence their story. We can influence their lives to follow after you. And so we thank you for these gifts of bread and juice and for what they remind us and for what they are, that they are life, eternal life, abundant life, and may we enjoy them as we enjoy you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. The cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. For the forgiveness of your sins, take and drink.
Thank you, Jesus, for your gifts to us, for the life that you give to us. And thank you for worshiping with us today. I pray that you will know that whatever your circumstances might be, God is with you. God is leading you. God hasn't forgotten you. God will get you to where he wants you to be in his time. So keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Don't become discouraged. Stay the course. He will get you there. God bless. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next weekend, whether in person or online. Amen.